Big audience. All right, so I'm going to start. Uh, my name is Todd Baker. I'm going to talk to you today about IOX, fog, and data in motion, explain to you what it's all about. All right? It's going to be a fun little journey here. We have a very intimate crowd here, so don't tell anybody, but feel free to ask questions as long as we don't disturb everybody else. Okay? So, give you a little bit of an introduction here. I think if any of you have watched the keynotes from Kip Compton, uh, General Manager, VP of the IoT Group, you'll see some of this content up front. I just wanted to give those that haven't seen that an introduction to, you know, how are we really viewing IoT IOE right now, and then how do these pieces all fit together, okay? So it's a little bit of marketing stuff up front, and then we'll get a little bit deeper, okay, as we go down through. So the first thing is, when we really look at this market, we see, you know, you're starting with these things, and on top of the things, we've got applications. And what's really kind of fun is, as we look at it at Cisco, I see it very differently than everybody else, because a lot of people, when they think of the Internet of Things, they think of consumer IoT. Now, I'm a big user of consumer IoT. I don't know if everybody else is. I typically have several devices on. I wear Garmin devices when I work out. I've got Fitbits. I've got all this stuff. But what we realize is in enterprise IoT, it's a little different. There's a couple other pieces in here that are really important. So we begin to build out what we're referring to as the IoT technology platform. So you're going to see us talk about this over and over and over again. Yes, as we build out the various pieces of it. Okay? But as we look at this platform, what we see is there's some core technologies that really transcend and go across all of the various layers. And those are things like cloud and fog, okay? Analytics, data analytics, listening to Mike Flanagan again yesterday, if you were in their keynote. Security and identity management. Open programmability for the Internet of Things systems. And really the kind of core of the ease of management requirements in this business. Now, I happen to live in the fog, so. I manage FOG, IOX, these technologies. So today, I'm going to focus on that piece of the horizontal technology and kind of walk you through what we see. So what's fun is, again, going back to consumer IoT, we see these devices all talking straight up to the cloud. And it's really not a problem, right? They're able to effectively do what they need to do, right? We can talk about examples like Uber. I don't know who else is using Uber here in the city, but I've found that it's like, really, it's hard to get a car, but when you do, they're like half the price of a taxi. Shh, don't tell the taxi drivers I said that, but it's true. So just keep that in mind for the rest of your trip here. But what we see in IoT is that there's so many more devices, and they're generating so much more data. They have very different requirements than you would see kind of in consumer IoT. So when we look at that, they kind of go into a couple of categories. We start to think about some of the challenges with actually taking enterprise IoT up to the cloud and cloud alone, okay? Those things are limited bandwidth. It's really funny, I was talking to one of my customers, um, an oil and gas customer about their uh, oil platforms, and I said, you know, how much bandwidth do you really have? Okay, really have? And they gave me an answer that made me kind of laugh and made me feel a little old. So I'm gonna date myself here. The guy looks at me and he says, about 1900 baud. I said, baud? That's not a word that I've heard in a long time. And it made me realize that my 10-year-old daughter is never going to experience the joy of hearing that sound, bouncing modems, and then that ultimate connect at the end. And that's what I think of when I think baud. But really, that's practical when you talk about IoT. The bandwidth is sometimes that limited. Okay? The other part is latency. Now you think about implementing real-time control systems out at the edge, sometimes you just can't put that control system up in the cloud. The speed of light, unfortunately, is a rule that we have not figured out how to conquer, and sometimes it does matter. So we're going to need control systems closer out to the edge as we take those IP. And the last one is network reliability. So if you've watched any of the press that we've done around this, you've seen a solution we've done with SAP and SK Solutions around connected cranes. And they literally have connected these cranes and all these construction sites, and they do collision avoidance. It is completely unacceptable for them to actually have a complete disconnect of the systems. So they would love to run everything up in the cloud, but from a practical point of view, even though I'm sure there's a Cisco account manager out there that would love to find a way to construct 10 layers of redundancy for them, it's just practically not realistic. 
okay? So being able to put intelligence out on the edge, in that case, literally in the crane, makes a big difference, okay? So when we looked at these challenges, what we said is it makes a lot of sense to insert another layer here. And we've called that the FOG, okay? Just for the record, it's not an acronym. It really is just a representation. So we looked at it and we said, okay, it's gonna be technology that's gonna be a little closer to the ground, a little closer to the endpoints, a little closer to where the action is really happening, okay? But it's actually not a replacement for cloud. And this is something that gets very, very confusing. I did an interview with a guy from the Wall Street Journal about a year ago, okay? And he wrote this article. And when he wrote it and released it, I was a little horrified because the title of the article was, forget the cloud, fog is here. I'm like, no, that's not the message, right? The message is we actually view this as a continuum, the data from the endpoints, needing some extra technology out closer to them, but ultimately focusing that all up into the cloud. For those applications that don't have those limitations, those challenges that I just talked about, a need for low latency, they have infinite bandwidth or sufficient bandwidth, and there aren't challenges around network reliability, build it in the cloud, I'm all for it. It makes a lot of sense. Efficiency of equipment, efficiency of operations, but for those, and we see a lot of them in IoT that actually do require one or more of those or hit one or more of those challenges, fog is gonna be the way we're gonna go after solving that problem. Now, when it comes to fog, you'll hear a product name or a product space called IOX, okay? And basically what this is, is that layer that we're talking about in fog and kind of our first instantiation of technology to go after those problems, okay? So ultimately what we did is we looked at those, we took IOX and we went after solving some of these problems. For instance, with Shell out in the oil platforms for limited bandwidth, with Fanuc looking at robots for control systems, and as I talked about with the SK solutions for the connected cranes and connected construction. But taking it one level deeper, what does it really mean? Today, what it means is we're taking a router or a switch that already has iOS running into it. And what's amazing is I give credit to a lot of the hardware uh, product managers and engineers out there over the years. There's platforms already deployed in the field that have multiple processors on them, but they only really needed one, or multiple cores in a single processor. It really only needed one when they released it to run iOS. And so there's nascent compute, nascent storage, already in those platforms. So the 819 is one of those platforms. If you're familiar with this thing out at the edge, it happens to have a dual core power PC processor inside. iOS uses one and we're actually turning on the other one. We lit it up. It got released in about November that we have IOX support on that platform. So what does that mean? It means as you need a little more intelligence out at the edge, you don't have to worry about how am I gonna find this other hardened server that now I have to manage and I'm managing Linux or Windows out on that and paying for more licensing for that and dealing with sparing for that and dealing with connectivity and the person, because it's out in a vehicle that wants to unplug the cable because they can. These are problems that operations people often look at and they're real problems and they cost money. So now what we're able to do is to actually integrate that all together in the same platform. Now the other thing it does we also get along with that access to the interfaces. So you think about a lot of non-IP technologies today, serial technologies. Now it may not be the sexiest thing to talk about, but there's still a ton of serial technology out there and unconnected un non-IP devices. If you look at uh, markets such as manufacturing, you may not know this, only about 4% of the devices in manufacturing are actually connected today. 96% of them are not networked, and they're not even using necessarily modern technology, so they're using these serial technologies. We can actually take these platforms, connect the serial to those older devices, legacy devices, and begin to network them, and begin to do intelligence out on the edge. Now, one of these tools that we have to deliver intelligence out on the edge, and for instance, these fog services, is something called data in motion. Okay, so I'm gonna dig in a little bit deeper around data in motion. We actually do have a learning lab that's up in the back of the room. Tomorrow, just so you know, at 11 a.m., if you really wanna get deep, a lot deeper after I go through this, we're going to have a classroom session for an hour. We've got 
you know, someone in there that knows the technology in and out that can answer every single question you want to know about it, okay? So why does data in motion really become important? Because as we look at data in this world, it's kind of an interesting thing. We, you may have seen this before. We've created this virtual hierarchy of needs of data, starting with this torrent of data out on the edge. Once you begin to filter that data, you actually end up beginning to create more value. So we move from all of the data. Everybody these days has a you know, data warehouse filled with stuff that they don't know what to do with. We move that up the stack to information, ultimately moving it even higher up to knowledge. And then we look, in the end, at wisdom. And these begin to, if you want to get a little bit more sophisticated about it, you begin to talk about regressive analysis. You begin to talk about predictive analysis, the hot topics around predictive maintenance. That's moving up the stack higher and higher. But the first step is ultimately getting through that high or that low signal to noise ratio because you practically can't deal with all that data and really getting to the good information. Again, data in motion is one of those tools that helps us to do that. So, what does it really mean? If you look at the picture, we tried to make this as illustrative as possible. It's taking data off the network. We're able to apply rules and policies and filters to that data as it's coming in and generate information out the top. Now, a couple simple examples that I use with this. I always talk about a temperature sensor. If you ever heard me talk about it, I always talk about this because those things are great. They produce a little bit of data but they produce it every 60 seconds. So you've got a sensor out there that's monitoring something like a transformer. It says the transformer is 40 degrees C. 60 seconds later, it says 40 degrees C. 60 seconds after that, it says 40 degrees C. And 60 seconds, every 60 seconds, for the next 60 years, it's going to tell you the exact same thing. That's not useful data. You need to keep that out at the edge, not waste network bandwidth, not waste any of your valuable resources in your data warehouse, because you have to store it as well. And so data in motion helps you get in between that layer and say, hey, look, I only want to send this information northbound if it actually has relevance, if it's past this high watermark, or if it's gone below this low watermark. Other than that, suppress the noise, okay? So just a little example to that to, to kind of bring it home. You look at a, an industry like oil and gas, and I will tell you, I'm seeing myself a lot of interest in oil and gas for these types of technologies out on the edge. And it just kind of fits. You know, it's got high latency environments. It's got low bandwidth environments. It's got really large geographical dispersion, harsh environments. So we actually see a lot of application of the technology in this space. So what are they worried about? leak detection. How do you actually triangulate really quickly where a leak is coming from? And that's real dollars. And there's other implications to that as well. Again, there's limitations to the networking connectivity that they've got. So you really need to optimize it. So what we're able to do is take one of these platforms. Again, I think this picture is an 819. Actually insert data and motion inside. So it's not another technology out there. It's just inside that existing platform that's out there that you may have in the field already and to begin monitoring things like these pressure sensors. And it's not just the ability to monitor and say, hey, I've noticed a drop somewhere. You can actually build the logic in to take action. So maybe you have one threshold, and that says notify somebody, right? But what if that connection's down? Do you have another threshold that says it's really dropped a lot, and therefore I actually need to turn a valve? So you could trigger that from that edge as well and take action while you're waiting for somebody to deal with. because. You know, in some places, at least in the U.S., this could be a two-week dog sled ride out into the middle of Alaska for somebody to actually get there and deal with it. So you have to take in consideration, you may need to take action locally. Now, just to go down to the next level, so for all the people that actually want to program this thing, I'm going to give you a glimpse. For everybody else, it'll be a little bit scary, but we're just going to go for it here into the programming model. The way it's actually constructed is in these things we call contexts. Think of them as just little separate user right and privilege, that's what URP means, sandboxes. So you could have your own set of rules, you could have your own set of rules, you could have your own set of rules all running inside that same box, okay? What's inside of that? We call the rules and the policies that are put in place these dynamic data definitions, D3s. End of the day, they're rules. Now, what does a D3 really look like? It's a set of patterns 
It's a set of conditions and it's a set of actions. Now, I don't actually expect you to read this slide on the right-hand side, but it is the foundation for the intelligence that you want to build out there. On top of that, we begin to build in things like meta information. What's the network definition? You know, what application do we want to monitor? Part of the power of this is we're actually able to get down into payload as well. So occasionally, we will come across a scenario where a vendor that we're working with, a third-party vendor, doesn't really want to tell us everything about their protocol. So they don't want us to have a full interpretation of their protocol. But because they're getting pressure from someone like a customer, there's a little bit of information they will give us that says, hey, at bit offsite, offset 42, there's one byte. And that byte means temperature. And so we're actually able to go in and pull that out of the payload without even understanding necessarily the rest of the payload and take action on it, which can be pretty powerful if you think about it. So beyond that, we can obviously do things like talking to basic web servers, monitoring JSON, et cetera. So a lot of capabilities that we'll talk about tomorrow, as well as that are exposed already up on developer.cisco.com. So if everybody wants to know, ultimately, this is what it looks like. You're creating a JSON payload with a simple structure to define what you want to do. This one is a timer that goes out and takes a reading and checks a threshold. All right? Let's sum that all up. What does it really mean? It really means we're writing this definition on the right-hand side, a set of rules, predicates, patterns to match, conditions, actions you want to take. And you're distributing it out into the edge, into the aggregation points. We can actually put this in multiple layers along the way. So you can stack these. You can make them recursive. You can make them reference each other. And we're building the power in that way to optimize the data flow northbound and the control southbound. Now, for anybody that wants to learn a little bit more as well, we are publishing the APIs as an open source project called Cricket inside Eclipse Foundation. So you could go there today and actually see exactly how to interact with the system. Now, if you want to learn more about this technology, IOX, data in motion, visit us on developer.cisco.com. We have an entire IoT section there that contains all these technologies. On that note, I'm going to stop and get this uh, back on track. Let me know if you have any questions after we're done. I'll be around for a couple minutes. Thank you very much.